<laughs> Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to have Daniel Stein with us. Unfortunately, we're not there in person, but it's really a pleasure to have him. Uh, so Daniel works on many, many different topics. So ranging from biophysics and looking at protein folding uh, to cosmology, and think about neutron stars and superfluids in various contexts and nanomagnets. But what he's really best known, I think, the, really diverse work across many, many fields, but it was really best known for, at least for me, uh, is his work on spin glasses and disorder systems and complexity. And actually he wrote a fantastic book uh, about a decade ago on that topic. So he really uh, launched a, a new way of thinking about problems in spin glasses, as well as glassic systems in general. And in fact, it, one of his most cited works is actually with his former advisor, Phil Anderson, and, and Elihu Abrahams thinking about terrible processes in glasses. So just a very brief biography on too much of his time. I mean, so uh, he got his PhD with Phil Anderson in Princeton and he stayed there as a faculty. Uh, and then he went to Arizona where he became the head of the department. And then he moved to NYU where he was shortly after Dean. And, uh, and now he's at NYU in the Karate Institute. So without further ado, and, he, and he's very well known in one of my projects. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Dan floor speak. All right. Well, thank you very much, Zohar, for that very kind introduction. And thank you also for the plug to the book. <laughs> and let me also thank everybody who's um, joining in today. So as Zohar said, I'm going to be talking about the thermodynamic structure of classical uh, short range spin glasses, which are a class of disordered magnetic systems. And um, you know, I understand that the, a number of people may not be that familiar with them. So uh, I will explain what they are and um, then we'll move on from there. But before I begin, I would just like to quickly acknowledge my uh, collaborators uh, on this particular problem, in particular Chuck Newman, with whom I've had a decades long collaboration on these and other problems, as well as John Macda, Michael Damron, Louis Pierre Gain, Nick Reed, and Yannick Ver, all of whom with which I've had enjoyable and productive collaborations. So uh, as um, everybody knows, uh, I'm sure a year ago, the Royal Swedish Academy awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics jointly to Suki, Suki Manabe and Klaus Hasselmann uh, for their work on climate science, uh, who shared half the prize, and the other half went to Giorgio Parisi for solving what was uh, at the time in the early 80s, um, the notoriously difficult problem of, of disentangling the, uh, the uh, thermodynamic structure of um, mean field spin glasses, as well as its applications to problems in computer science and, um, and biology. And in particular, the solution, which is known as replica symmetry breaking, um, introduced a new kind of ordering uh, that was unlike anything that we had ever seen before. So um, clearly uh, spin glasses are a very important problem, uh, not just in condensed matter physics and statistical mechanics, but uh, also in mathematical physics as well. And so what I will do is I will begin with a brief summary <clears throat> of spin glasses, both from the experimental and theoretical viewpoints. Then I will turn to the main features of Parisi's solution, known as I said, known as replica symmetry breaking or RSB. Uh, and then uh, given uh, you know, hopefully enough time, I will then tell you about what we now understand about the uh, still unsolved problem of short range spin glasses. So um, this problem, uh, really the, the modern spin glass problem goes back to the early 70s. Those of you who you know, study condensed metaphysics or you know, like me have been around for more than a few years may know that in the uh, 60s and, and early and 70s, um, one of the uh, major problems in condensed matter physics was the so-called Kondo problem, which dealt with uh, the uh, electrical conductivity properties of uh, what are known as dilute magnetic alloys. This is where you take a, um, a magnetic impurity such as um, iron or manganese and you dilute it uh, at very, very low dilutions into a um, non-magnetic metallic host like copper, silver, gold. Usually it's one of the noble metals. And this had very unusual resistivity properties 
but um, that's only the, the prologue to the story. Uh, in the early 1970s, people started looking at these systems in earnest, trying to untangle their magnetic properties when concentrations, in, in, in the condo problem, concentrations were only at a few tenths of a percent of impure magnetic impurity. They upped that by a factor of 10 or so, looking at you know anywhere between one to 10% of impurity, where the uh, localized magnetic moments of the magnetic impurity, let's say the iron atoms in um, uh, you know, something like uh, you know, iron copper, um, start to interact with each other. And so this is one, what I'm showing here is, and I hope everybody can see my pointer. In fact, um, let me let me change this to, let me put on the uh, uh, laser pointer here. That may make it a little easier, okay? So I hope everybody can see that. If not, let me know. So uh, this is a classic experiment uh, from the very early 70s in which uh, Canella et al. Uh, looked at the magnetic susceptibility of, I think this was gold uh, iron. Uh, so it's a few percent of iron atoms diluted in a gold uh, matrix, that 1% iron, 2% up to 8%. And as you see, the magnetic susceptibility shows a cusp. And as, <clears throat> as you know, I'm sure you're aware, uh, that is typically indicative of phase transition. And you know, for those who are, you know, remember the solid state physics, this kind of cusp is usually associated with an anti-ferromagnetic phase transition from a, you know, a paramagnet to an anti-ferromagnet where, you know, the spins alternate uh, their orientations as one moves around the lattice. Uh, but neutron scattering experiments uh, to look at the, you know, to determine the structure of the magnetic ordering uh, showed that there was no uh, ordering of any regular kind in space. It looked as if the, um, the uh, iron uh, magnetic moments, which we'll just call spins from here on, were frozen into random orientations, which in fact was the case. So um, uh, just to, uh, for just brief review, um, you know, and where this is where spin glasses got their name, Right, so of course, in a, you know, in a crystal, these are just simple idealized sketches. The atoms sit in a regular periodic array, whereas in a glass, the atoms are quenched into random configurations as if one took a snapshot of a liquid. Um, so there's no kind of translational order. Similarly, in ordered magnetic systems, in a ferromagnet, for example, the spins are all aligned. You know, uh, you know, just very roughly speaking. In an anti-ferromagnet, they alternate up, down, up, down. Um, those are both uh, have order and regularity. <clears throat> in the spin glass, however, the spins, as you see in the sketch, are frozen into random orientations uh, as if one took a snapshot of a configuration of a paramagnet. Hence the name spin glass because it's the magnetic analog to a glass. And uh, these are problems with quench disorder which is very difficult to deal with. We know how to deal with thermal disorder. That's why st statistical mechanics was really invented to deal with those problems, like a gas or a liquid or a paramagnet, where the system you know, flips through um, these disordered microstates, um, you know, 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 15 per second, so that you, one can do an ergodic averaging over all of the different disordered mac microstates and thereby arrive at a, a, a macroscopic thermodynamic picture. But when you have quenched disorder, uh, it's very difficult to average over the disorder. In particular, it turns out one has to average over the free energy, uh, which is the logarithm of the partition function um, when, if you want to average over the disorder. And this presents a number of mathematical challenges. So um, let me just briefly describe um, where uh, spin glass behavior comes from. In fact, it turns out that there are different kinds of spin glasses. They all have very similar magnetic behaviors, even though the microscopic structure is very different. Um, but dilute magnetic alloys are sort of a uh, sort of the most well-known case. So I'll discuss those. So in a dilute magnetic alloy, you know, you have this magnetic impurity, and uh, if the spin is localized, then due to conduction electron scattering and the sharpness of the Fermi surface, one has oscillations of the magnetic polarization of the conduction electrons surrounding 
that localized magnetic moment. So that <clears throat> nearby the localized magnetic moment, the um, uh, the conduction electron spins um, may you know are going to be mostly aligned with the. Uh, localized moment, whereas if you move a little distance away, they will be anti-aligned. This positive J corresponds to a ferromagnetic interaction that tends to make the spins want to align. The negative uh, J corresponds to anti-ferromagnetic interactions, which make them want to anti-align. And this is known as the RKKY interaction. Uh, so basically, the um, localized spin sets uh, due to diffraction and interference of the electron waves sets up concentric spheres of alternating polarization of the conduction electron spins. Of course, the electrons themselves are moving around, but if one took a snapshot at any time of the spin orientations, one would see concentric spheres of alternating um, magnetization aligned with the localized moment and anti-aligned. And you know the, the, it falls off as one over R cubed. This is a famous result from, I guess, the 50s. Uh, it's similar to Friedel oscillations when you have a localized uh, charge uh, in a metal, uh, the charge uh, density then oscillates in a similar way. Um, but uh, it's this kind of behavior where you have both ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic interactions within the same system that is really the ultimate determinant of spin glass behavior. If anything I say, by the way, is unclear, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask. Okay, so now, uh, the, of course, the major question, the first question you ask in condensed matter physics is, so of course, at high temperature, all, syst all magnetic systems are paramagnets where, you know, that's the, equi the, the magnetic equivalent to a gas, you know, where the spins just at every site just keep flipping so that the time average is zero of the magnetization at any site. But at low temperature, you know, then is there a transition to a phase where the thermal average or the time average of the spins is non-zero. Well, I already showed you this uh, picture here of the magnetic susceptibility where you see a, a cusp, and that is indicative of a phase transition. But of course, that should apply to other thermodynamic functions as well. And it turns out that if one looks at the specific heat, uh, and here's a graph of copper manganese, um, you see that, in fact, there's no indication of a phase transition. It's nice and round. And in fact, we see this arrow here. This is where the susceptibility cusp, you know, this thing over here, uh, occurs in this particular material. And it's not even at the maximum. Nothing seems to be, whoops, nothing seems to be happening there. So if you ask if there's a phase transition, why we're getting conflicting information from specific heat and, uh, and magnetic susceptibility measurements. So, um, you know, over time, the consensus of the physics community looks something like the RKKY interaction with the magnitude being the number of people working on the problem as time goes on. However, at this point, um, mostly due to, due to both experimental and numerical simulations, uh, we are pretty well convinced that there is indeed a phase transition in three dimensions. But what the nature of that phase transition is, we don't know. So now let me uh, quickly turn to turn to theory. So basically, this the, this is um, these are the main experimental features of spin glasses: the cusp and the susceptibility. Um, there's others as well. I'm just doing a, just a few um, a smooth behavior of the specific heat, and then there's some interesting non-equilibrium behavior such as aging as well that also characterizes the spin glass phase. Now, um, most theoretical studies now follow from a paper written in 1975 by Sam Edwards and Phil Anderson. And uh, they, um, their uh, basic point of view was that you can ignore all of the microscopic details. What really determines spin glass behavior is a competition between quenched ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic interactions within the same system. So they proposed a simple looking Hamiltonian. I have the full one here, but let's just set the magnetic field. This refers to the magnetic field here. Let's just set that to zero so that I have a global spin flip symmetry in the problem. So one puts a spin at the sites X and Y in a cubic lattice in D dimensions. And we'll always take these spins to be easing spins. They can take on the values plus or minus one. Now the couplings between nearest neighbor spins only here 
Um, you know, and every edge on the cubic lattice, one assigns a coupling J, which represents these, both the type and the strength of the interaction between nearest neighbor spins. And these couplings are taken to be um, independent, identically distributed random variables, and we will take their distribution to be symmetric about zero, such as plus or minus j with probability of half, or as I show here, well, I'll, I'll stick to this, a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance one. So there's equal probability for a particular site, um, the initial, the probability that you see a a uh, positive coupling is one half and a negative coupling is a half. Positive corresponds to a ferromagnetic interaction, clearly with this minus sign here, positive J means the spins want to align to lower the energy. Negative J means they want to anti-align to lower the energy. And um, so one, and, and this J here refers to a realization of the couplings because for any spin glass sample, um, the couplings are frozen in. So one has to, you know, th this, refers, this refers to the probability distribution of the J's independently at every site, um, but one has to choose the J's according to this probability distribution to get a particular sample. It's like when you have, let's say, a sequence of coin flips where, uh, you know, use equal probability of heads or tails, a realization of that distribution would be, you know, you just start flipping coins and maybe you get a sequence like heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 and so on, that's a particular realization. And so one, uh, you know, one then uh, chooses each coupling from this distribution. And once you choose that coupling, that is frozen in for all time. So that is where the quench disorder of the system comes from. And different coupling realizations, of which clearly there's an uncountable infinity, correspond to different spin glass samples. Um, and, um, uh, let's see. Okay, good. Um, so uh, notice that one of the uh, consequences of this is that one has what's called frustration. Let me just look at a simple square and a two-dimensional lattice. I'll just look at four sites and the uh, edges connecting them. And suppose I simply flip a coin, heads ferromagnetic, tails anti-ferromagnetic. So, you know, I get heads, heads, heads here and tails here. So this is the quenched couplings for this particular plaquette as it's called. And you see that um, it, it turns out that if the product of the couplings where F corresponds to a positive coupling and anti-ferromagnetic to negative coupling is negative, there is no way you can choose the spins which can only point up or down here to satisfy all of the couplings, right? Here, if this spin is up, then this spin will be up due to this interaction. And then this spin will be up due to this interaction. But when I get to this spin, it's getting conflicting instructions from this spin and this spin. There's no way to satisfy all of them. And that is known as frustration. Um, the other thing that Edwards and Anderson did is to um, propose an order parameter for spin glasses. They said that spin glasses or systems with quench disorder in general are characterized by broken symmetry in time, but not in space. In other words, suppose one takes a spin, looks at a uh, spin glass in the low temperature phase, the spin glass phase, then, um, and, and one looks at the thermal average of, you know, each spin in the lattice, then the, um, the one then takes a spatial average of those, one uh, looks at the thermal average, sums them up and divides by N, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, either on the regular lattice or on any uh, regular sub lattice, uh, one will then get, uh, one gets zero because the spins are pointing in random directions. However, the broken symmetry in time means that the spins are frozen. Namely, instead of looking at the expectation of the spin, one looks at the, uh, the square of the expectation. So, uh, in, you know, in this case, you know, in the paramagnet, the thermal average is zero at every site, but in the spin glass, it's non-zero. So if one looks at the spatial average of the square of the thermal expectation of the spin at every site, one then gets a strictly positive number, which is known as the Edwards-Anderson order parameter or Q sub EA. Okay, so zero magnetization and non-zero Edwards-Anderson order parameter then was suggested by them as the signature of a uh, of a spin glass. Okay, so now um, 
let me uh, turn to the question of, uh, you know, if there really is a phase transition with bro broken uh, spin flip symmetry, what is the nature of the broken symmetry in the low temperature phase? So um, the, our one guide to this is basically the problem that Parisi solved, which is uh, replica symmetry breaking. And this is for the Hamiltonian that was suggested by Sherrington and Kirkpatrick a few months months after Edwards and Anderson proposed their Hamiltonian. And basically what uh, Sherrington and Kirkpatrick did, this was in late 1975, is they proposed the Hamiltonian that was an infinite range version of the, um, of the uh, Edwards-Anderson model. In other words, instead of putting the spins on a Euclidean lattice, you put the spins on a graph uh, where every uh, pair of nodes or sites is connected by an edge, by a single edge. And on every edge, you have a coupling. So essentially, every spin is a nearest neighbor to every other spin, which is why you have this factor of one over square root of n here. Again, we'll just take the h's to be zero, uh, because you know whenever you have these mean field or infinite range models, you need to rescale by the number of spins. In the Curie-Weiss model, you would have a factor of one over n. That's the mean field model of ferromagnets uh, in order to have a sensible thermodynamic limit, in order to have the energy per spin go to some finite number that is neither zero nor infinity. Okay, so, so it turns out, well, before I get to this, let me just point out that Sherrington and Kirkpatrick tried to solve the model with the uh, assumption that the ordering was given by the Edwards-Anderson order parameter. And the solution they found turned out they were able to solve it um, because of course it's always simpler to solve mean field models uh, than the real one. Uh, but uh, they found that their solution was unstable. At low temperature, the entropy went negative. So there was clearly a problem with it. And it took four years before Parisi uh, was able to solve this problem. That, that was in 1979 and another half a decade before people understood what the Parisi solution meant. So here is a description of the Parisi solution of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick infinite range or mean field model of spin glasses by some of the uh, originators of uh, replica symmetry breaking, including Parisi. They say the Gibbs equilibrium measure decomposes into a mixture of many pure states. Uh, instead of an order parameter, you have an order parameter function called the overlap distribution function, and that this is non-trivial uh, in the spin glass. And um, what I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so doing is to um, uh, try to explain what this means. So, um, so let me uh, first, the, so the, the first sentence here is the Gibbs equilibrium measure decomposes into a mixture of many pure states. So the first thing is that replica symmetry breaking says that the spin glass, so first of all, uh, of course, an infinite volume, a, thermodyn a thermodynamic state is an infinite volume Gibbs state. That is a probability measure on infinite volume spin configurations. And the probabilities are given by the usual Boltzmann distribution. Um, and a pure state is uh, an extremal Gibbs state. That is, it cannot be written as a linear combination of any other Gibbs states. It's similar to pure and mixed states in quantum mechanics, although with some differences. So basically a pure state is a state that cannot be written as any combination of other Gibbs states. And if you do write, have a Gibbs state, that is a linear combination of pure states that is called a mixed state. So according to replica symmetry breaking, so just as an example, in the ferromagnet, we have two pure states, right? The positive magnet for the easing model, the, the positively magnetized pure state and the negatively magnetized pure state. At high temperature, the paramagnet, that's also a pure state. There, the thermal expectation of every spin is zero. But according to replica symmetry breaking, the spin glass has many thermodynamic pure states that are unrelated by any symmetry transformation whatsoever. So, um, uh, so then given the fact that you have infinitely many states and they're not related by any symmetry transformation, how do you describe ordering? And Parisi had the brilliant idea to look at the relations between the states. So um, now I'll just introduce a little bit of mathematics. So if you recall the first sentence, they said the Gibbs equilibrium measure 
decomposes into a mixture of um, you know infinitely many pure states. So this, it's written. So this gamma here represents uh, the mixed Gibbs state, the the equilibrium state that they're talking about, and it can be decomposed as a countable infinity of pure states. Each pure state is you know has magnetizations that look you know, in random directions, and they each look different from the others. And the Ws refer to the weights of the pure states. Uh, these weights uh, sum up to one, and basically they give the probability that um, a particular pure state will make its appearance in the overall mixed Gibbs state. And now one defines the overlap <coughs> between pure states which um, is basically a measure of how similar the pure states are. So suppose I have two pure states, alpha and beta, then the overlap between, um, uh, the, uh, between the pure states, alpha and beta. Well, I take the thermal expectation of the spin at side X in pure state alpha, and the thermal expectation of the spin at side X in pure state beta, and these will be different because of different pure states. And, um, and, uh, you know, then one, uh, you know, takes that product and divides by the volume, and then one takes that going to infinity. And you can also look at the overlap of a state with itself. If you set alpha equal to beta, you'll notice that you get, what you get back is, is the Edwards-Anderson order parameter. So another way of thinking of the Edwards-Anderson order parameter is the self-overlap of a state. Of course, at zero temperature, the overlap of a state with itself is one, because it's that's a spin configuration, but a positive temperature, each pure state, you know, it lives on, you know, infinitely many different spin configurations. So the thermal average will strictly be less than one. Uh, and, and that will give you the Edwards-Anderson order parameter. Okay, so now the next step is that you look at the distribution of these overlaps, and that's given by this overlap distribution function for a fixed coupling realization. And what this means basically is the following. So you have this mixed Gibbs state that is a, an uncountable infinity of many pure states, each with different weights. And so, you know, I simply pick two pure states at random from the Gibbs state, uh, and the probability of picking a particular state depends on its weight within that mixed Gibbs state. And this tells you the probability that if, that if I just randomly pick two pure states from the overall Gibbs state, that the overlap has value Q. For example, suppose I look at the easing ferromagnet below TC. Here, there's only two pure states. Here, the mixed Gibbs state is an equal mixture of the positively magnetized state and the negatively magnetized state, right? If you put on, let's say, a volume with periodic boundary conditions, right, that you'll, you'll generate a Gibbs state that lives on each of these with probability a half. And so here, if I look at the overlap, right, there's only two states, so there's only two possibilities, there's four, but there's really only two possibilities in terms of the overlap, namely I pick the same state out twice, or else I pick out a state in this global flip. So here P of Q is just a pair of delta functions at plus or minus the square of the magnetization. Now, according to replica symmetry breaking, however, you have a non-trivial overlap structure. Um, you, you, you do have a non-zero probability of picking the same state or the state in its global flip um, uh, when you do it, but you also have the probability of picking out the similar states. And so, of course, there's infinitely many of these overlaps, but most will be too small to see on a graph like this. So this is just a sketch of the kind of distribution you might see for a particular coupling real realization. So that's what they mean when they say that the overlap structure, basically the, you know, as I said, the overlap is basically a measure of how similar the two states are, right? Um, at zero temperature, you know, it's basically the number of spins that agree minus the number of spins that disagree divided by the total number of spins. Um, so, um, so that's the first um, consequence of replica symmetry breaking, but then they have an additional thing called non-self averaging, meaning that suppose I look at two different samples, one with coupling realization J1, the other with coupling realization J2 then basically uh, even in the thermodynamic limit, no matter how large a system I look at, I'll always have that pair of delta functions at plus or minus Q Edwards Anderson um, because the self overlap of every pure state is the same in replica symmetry breaking. But the overlaps for dissimilar states will appear at different locations and with different weights. 
And so now, if one now averages over the disorder, if one um, you know looks at the average of this over all possible coupling realizations of which there's an uncountable infinity, one gets this nice smooth distribution with non-zero weight at Q equals zero between these goalposts at plus or minus QEA. And it is this thing uh, or a function closely related to it that people refer to as the um, Parisi order parameter. So, um, so, so now, so deconstructing this, what the, what they're saying here, what this means is that there's basically four main features, only some of which are mentioned here. The first is that you have infinitely many pure thermodynamic states, unrelated by any simple symmetry transformation. The second is that you have an infinite number of order parameters, in fact, an order parameter function rather than a number that characterizes the distribution of the overlaps of the states. You also have non-self-averaging of the state overlaps, no matter how large a sample you look at, there are sample to sample fluctuations. And then there's this another thing called ultrametric structure of distances among states. And the distance between two states is simply Q Edwards Anderson minus the overlap. It's how dissimilar the states are. And it turns out that uh, these have a these basically are arranged as if they were descended from a hierarchical uh, but from a hierarchical tree, sort of like kinship relations. Um, I, I, can't, I don't have time to go into this in, in a lot of detail, but the basic point and what the Nobel Committee uh, emphasized is that from that very simple Hamiltonian uh, with just, just a disorder and not much else, you get a tremendous amount of structure and this very exotic kind of symmetry breaking that doesn't look like anything we've seen before. This is what the Nobel Committee referred to as order from disorder. Now, um, now, it turns out that mathematicians have been very interested in this, and over the past 20 years or so, a number of mathematicians have, um, have, um, have proven various aspects of replica symmetry breaking, although not all. And at this point, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that that is the correct solution of the Sherring Kirkpatrick infinite range mean field model. Uh, now, the first question you might want to ask is, has it been observed in physical systems? And you might think the first place to look is in laboratory spin glasses. It turns out, as I'll get to, uh, running out of time, but hopefully I'll get to talk about this a little bit. Um, uh, uh, it turns out that the situation there is, is, is very unsettled and uh, uh, I'll get to that shortly, but it turns out it has been seen in at least one physical system, which are random lasers. So random lasers are open systems in which light is confined within the gain medium through multiple scattering events due to disorder and inhomogeneities. And as a result, there are many possible lasing modes. In fact, there are typically thousands in the typical systems, and these different lasing modes correspond to the different states of spin glasses. So the idea here is that each these are pump these are pulsed lasers. So each uh, each um, emission spectrum defines um, you know one of these uh, states of uh, the random laser under the same conditions, and then one analyzes the intensity fluctuations between the different shots, and those correspond to the overlaps. So this shows this you know, overlap between intensity fluctuations at, um, at six different levels of pump power. Here, the pump power corresponds to the inverse temperature at very low pump power. The different modes oscillate independently. There's no correlation. So this is like the high temperature paramagnetic phase in which P of Q would be a delta function simply at Q equals zero because there there's only a single state and you know, that's it. Um, but uh, as one increases the pump powers, mode coupling in, increases, uh, and one this starts to broaden out, and one gets this kind of distribution, like you, like I showed you earlier. And this was cited by the Nobel Committee as um, you know, a, as an example of a physical observation of replica symmetry breaking. Okay, so now let me turn to short range spin glasses, which uh, I've already discussed. And now let's ask, now, of course, mean field models typically correspond to the model you're interested in infinite dimensions. What about finite dimensions? Well, usually, now we all know that mean field theories are not good guides to what's going on near the critical temperature, but they are very good guides you know, traditionally, for looking at the very low temperature properties of uh, of condensed matter systems where thermal fluctuations are small. 
Uh, in particular, they are usually very good at telling you the nature of broken symmetry in the order parameter. Uh, you know, was sort of the superconducting order parameter, for example, was first derived from Ginsburg-Landau mean field theory, and that's true for you know other systems as well. So, what about spin glasses? Now, I'm going to have to skip a few things here because uh, uh, I want to get to uh, the main point. So um, it turns out that the situation remains open uh, in, in, in finite dimensions for short range spin glasses. Most people who work in the field have one of three views. The first is that, uh, which I would say probably the majority hold, is that replica symmetry breaking does indeed hold in three dimensions, which of course is what in physics we care about as well as higher dimensions. And then there's another point of view, which I'll get to if I have time, that replica symmetry breaking does not hold in any finite dimension, no matter how high you go. That is, you know, the dimension goes to infinity limit, it's singular for the spin glass. You know, these systems with quench disorder just don't behave the, the way that we're used to with more conventional ordered systems. So that is a separate point of view. And then there's a third point of view, sort of in between. And all of these, by the way, have some evidence to support them. That's why the situation is confused. That above six dimensions, replica symmetry breaking is indeed the, the correct description of the Edwards Anderson model, but below six dimensions, you need a different picture. So if replica symmetry breaking doesn't hold, then then what does? And it turns out there are several competing pictures, which I'll get to. The good news is that out of an infinity of possible scenarios, many of those, in fact, almost all have been ruled out. And if I can, at the very end, I will tell you how of the remaining ones, they can be classified within a unified framework. Now, before I talk about that, first we have to talk about if replica symmetry breaking holds in any finite dimension, what does it look like? You know, I gave you a description of, you know, what uh, you know, it, it, the claim was it looks like in the infinite range model. Um, well, what does it look like? Uh, what would it look like in the Edwards Anderson model? Um, so now I'm going to uh, give you a, a bunch of rigorous results that we have, uh, you know, gotten over the last 30 years or so uh, up until the present day that uh, really narrows down the possibilities. So first, remember, you know, that, so the first thing that uh, they said is that the, the um, equilibrium state, that is the infinite volume Gibbs state is a mixed state that lives on a countable infinity of pure states or pure state pairs because every state comes with this global flip because you have broken spin flip symmetry. So it turns out, you know, well, first of all, let's throw out all the stuff and just look at the Edwards Anderson Hamiltonian and then apply, you know, you know, rigorous statistical mechanics to it and see what are the possibilities. So the first result, uh, you know, what can, if you have a mixed Gibbs state at all, what can it look like? It turns out it's very restricted as to what it can look like in the Edwards Anderson model. There's only three possibilities. Either it lives on a single pure state, like in the paramagnet, in which case it's not a mixed Gibbs state, it's just a pure state or it's a pair of spin reversed pure states as in the as we do you know from the easing ferromagnet or else it's infinitely many pure state pairs what you cannot have is a finite number of pair pure state pairs greater than 1 you can't have 20 pure state pairs or something like that it's either one a single spin reversed pair or infinitely many pure state pairs that's the first thing. The second thing uh, came as a bit of a shock when we first published this, and there was a lot of, well, <laughs> there was a lot of discussion, let's say, but we were, we proved that, you know, the original picture that, uh, you know, as the, that sort of is implied at least by the statement before it, they, the, the equilibrium state is a, you know, mixture of many pure states. It turns out that you, what you cannot have, you, you can't have a single mixed Gibbs state sitting on many pure state pairs. It is rigorously, rigorously ruled out uh, with probability one for at any dimension and at any temperature. Okay, so that means that that doesn't rule out replica symmetry breaking. It means we have to modify our conception of it. So what the first conclusion that we have is that, which we, you know, uh, this was, goes back to the mid nineties. If replica symmetry breaking does hold at any dimension or any temperature in the Edwards-Anderson model, then the pure states 
can't be arranged as originally thought, namely, you know, they sit in a single mixed Gibbs state, um, you know, with all of these properties. But in fact, you have to, this, this, this is getting very complicated sounding, but in fact, you have to have more than one. In fact, many distinct mixed Gibbs states and each of those lives on a countable infinity of pure state pairs. So, you know, basically, instead of having a single mixed state with many pure states, you have many mixed states, each of which lives on a countable infinity of pure state pairs. Now you can ask, well, how many, uh, we say we, you know, it can't be a single one. Well, how many mixed Gibbs states are there? Is there two, 10, infinity? Well, we can prove uh, we can have a we have a rigorous result there too and and this is you know gets a little mind blowing at this point um namely if if you do have gibbs states that live on more than a single pure state pair that is if you do have mixed uh, gibbs states that are that live on you know a countable infinity of pure state pairs say as uh, replica symmetry breaking demands then you have to have an uncountable infinity of mixed gibbs states in other words the picture is you have all of these mixed gibbs states there's an uncountable infinity of them and each of these lives on a countable decomposition, uh, a countable infinity of pure states. So they all live on different pure states with different weights, and one has a very complex picture. So basically the conclusion that if replica symmetry breaking describes a spin glass phase in any dimension, you have an uncountable infinity of mixed Gibbs states, each of which is supported on a countable infinity of pure state pairs. And um, well, let me, uh, I don't have time to really go over all of these because I sort of want to get to um, uh, the, I want to, I sort of want to get to uh, the, 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 the um, you know, the, the last few things I promised, but I will just say um, that basically all of the features of replica symmetry breaking, um, you know, like ultramatricity and all that, basically do not apply to all of the pure states that are around as originally thought, but only to the pure states within a single mixed Gibbs state. And the different mixed Gibbs states, you know, those, those all have different um, overlap distributions. And when you average over all of them, even for a single coupling realization, you get the Parisi order parameter um, as shown earlier. Okay, so now let me finish by uh, in the last 10 minutes, turning to the viable scenarios for the equilibrium spin glass phase in finite dimensions. So I discussed replica symmetry breaking where you have uh, already discussed many thermodynamic states, uh, each on accountable infinity of pure states. And um, then you have three other pictures. The most well-known is the so-called droplet scaling picture introduced by in the mid eighties by Bill Mac McMillan, Alan Bray, and Mike Moore, Daniel Fisher, and David Hughes. And this is a very different picture from the replica symmetry breaking uh, picture. Uh, and this is, this is the picture that gave rise to this idea that replica symmetry breaking does not hold in any finite dimension at all. In droplet scaling, you only have a single pair of pure states. You have a single mixed Gibbs state living on a single pair of pure states, like the, um, like the ferromagnet, but it has important differences from the ferromagnet too. Of course, these, you know, the, the spin orientations in these pure states looks random. Um, and basically, it's called a droplet scaling picture because it starts from the onsets that the thermodynamics at low temperatures of finite dimensional spin glasses are controlled by compact droplet excitations whose typical energy increases with the size of these excitations. You also have an, another picture called TNT or uh, trivial, um, tr uh, trivial ed edge overlap, non-trivial spin overlap introduced by Matteo Palacini and Peter Young and independently by Florent Jacquelin and Olivier Martin. And this is also a two-state picture. Once again, you have a single pair of pure states Okay, as in as in the droplet scaling picture, but the nature of the excitations is different. In in droplet scaling, the excitations are compact droplets, and their energies. You know, if you overturn such a droplet, the energy above the ground state you get scales with the size of the droplet. Whereas in TNT, the excitations are extended; they're presumably infinite in extent, and the energy does not scale with size. The energy remains order one on all length scales. 
There's finally a picture uh, which we call chaotic pairs. This was suggested by Chuck Newman and me, not because we advocated it, but because in our investigations, this sort of dropped out as a viable possibility that had not been considered before. So chaotic pairs is different from all of these. In this, as in replica symmetry breaking, you have many mixed Gibbs states, but the pure state structure is simple as in droplet scaling and, and TNT. In each of these different Gibbs states, they live on, again, a single pure state spin reverse pure state pair. It's just that the different Gibbs states, you know, in droplet scaling and CNT, there's only one Gibbs state and one pair of pure states. In chaotic pairs, there's multiple Gibbs states. Each of these decomposes into, you know, um, uh, you know, simply a single pair, each with probability a half of spin reverse pure states, but the different Gibbs states live on different pure states. So there are many pure states, but the arrangement, the structure of pure states is simple. So these are the four pictures that at this point have, are, that pretty much is what's left. I mean, there are other possibilities, but they've either been ruled out rigorously by us or else um, they're ruled out by numerical and, uh, and numerical results and experiments. And if one is interested in how experiment looks at this, I have a reference here. I don't have time to discuss it more because I do want to, I think I can finish this um, within 50 minutes. So I do want to get to sort of uh, you know, sort of where we are now with some more recent results. Okay, so I've introduced four pictures and I've discussed this in a rather formal mathematical framework of you know, infinite volume thermodynamic states you know, being mixtures and what they look like and how many and so on and so forth. But I wanna get a little bit more physical now. And, um, and in so doing, actually talk about how these pictures are all related. So this uh, appears in a paper that was just published um, earlier this year. And um, uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do now, I want to shift our focus from the numbers of states and their overlaps and all of that, which are sort of these abstract non-physical kinds of things, to uh, just looking at the large length scale, low energy excitations above the ground states, okay? Now, um, uh, uh, a, a very useful result, uh, I should mention, that is the starting point for scaling droplet and TNT, basically looking at the excitations above the ground state, but it was not the starting point for replica symmetry breaking or chaotic pairs. Um, nevertheless, these pictures can all be described and differentiated from each other by looking at the excitations above the ground state. And a very useful result in this regard um, is a theorem that we published earlier that suppose you have a many state picture, suppose you have many, uh, let, let, let's suppose you have many ground states. Let's just focus on ground states. Well, I guess that's what I said we'd focus on. So basically here, the Gibbs states, they're just spin configurations, right? A ground state is just a simple, is, is nothing more than a single spin configuration. So, um, so, so, the, so the interface, uh, so, so what, what we showed basically is that if you do have um, many state pictures, if I have a large length scale, low energy excitation above a ground state, that actually can be directly related to interfaces between ground states. What I mean by an interface between two spin configurations, whether a ground state and an excitation or two different ground states, is simply uh, the set of coupling, you know, the set of uh, couplings uh, that are satisfied in one of the ground states and unsatisfied in the other. Okay, now, that is a ferromagnetic interaction. If you have a ferromagnetic coupling and the spins are anti-aligned, it's unsatisfied. If they're aligned, it's satisfied. Opposite for anti-ferromagnetic couplings. So it's simply the set of couplings, regardless of whether they're ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, that are satisfied in one ground state and not in the other. Another way to think about it, it's a set of edges in the dual lattice that are uh, that separate regions where the spins agree in the two configurations from regions where they disagree. So that's what we mean by an interface. And now there's two questions that we can ask about interfaces. And then this is the uh, last slide before I get to the conclusions. Um, so the first question we can ask is, is the excitation, now we're looking at the infinite system here. So is the excitation positive or zero density? By positive density, I mean the following. Suppose I look at a very large volume and I look at the interface 
uh, between you know the uh, you know the exit you know the lowest energy uh, large length scale excitation above the ground state and the ground state. Um, if the number of 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 edges of the number of couplings um, uh, in the interface divided by the total number of couplings in the volume uh, stays bounded away from zero as the size of the system goes to infinity, we say it's positive density. That is a positive fraction of couplings in the infinite volume system live in the interface. Or another way of saying it is that the interface has the same dimensionality as the space dimensionality. Of course, zero density is where the density of the interface goes to zero as one looks at larger and larger scales. That corresponds to something like a domain wall in a ferromagnet, which has strictly lower dimension than the, at least in an easing ferromagnet, has strictly lower dimension than the spatial dimensionality of the system. So the first is the geometry, positive or zero density. The second is the energy. Namely, as I move along the interface, does the energy of the interface increase without bound? Does it get larger and larger as I look at larger and larger volumes? Or does it always remain of order one, which is predicted by TNT picture and replica symmetry breaking? And I can form a little table, basically a two by two table with these four possibilities where the rows refer to the um, geometry, space filling, or zero density, and the columns to the energy. Does the energy remain of order one, or does the energy increase with the distance along the interface? And it turns out that each of these pictures fills in one of these slots uh, or whatever entries uh, in this table. So it's no accident that there are four pictures. It turns out that these exhaust the possibilities uh, of um, you know, of what one can have. And I should mention that it is interesting to note that if one has a system where all of the couplings have the same sign, like a ferromagnet or an anti-ferromagnet, you know, all the couplings are positive or all the couplings are negative, you can you cannot have space filling interfaces and you you know the it must be of lower dimensionality than the system uh, well i put it this way for a thermodynamically relevant excitation i should say it cannot be space filling it must be zero density and moreover the energy of the interface must increase with distance along the interface and it's, it's interesting to note but spin glasses as far as we know i mean one of the tasks ahead is to see, you know, whether any of these possibilities can be ruled out. But as of now, they all remain viable possibilities. So um, the interesting thing to note is that replica symmetry breaking is the only one of the four that has both properties that are forbidden for ferromagnets and anti-ferromagnets. So in that sense, at least, you can describe it as a picture that is farthest from what we know about in more conventional systems. Okay, so with that, let me wrap up. So, of course, um, I've made a number of assumptions here that, that have not been proven yet. Um, so, so uh, in terms of the kinds of questions I've been asking, there are many open questions, but in terms of what I've been asking here, um, the first, well, it would be nice to prove that there really is a phase transition in the edwards anderson model. We definitely know there's a phase transition in the Sherrington and Kirkpatrick model. That was already shown by Sherrington and Kirkpatrick. We do believe that there is one with a lower critical dimension between two and three. That is largely due to experiments and numerical simulations. Uh, there is very little theory here to uh, really guide us. So the first thing is to prove that you have a phase transition. Uh, well, we all believe there is, but still it would be nice to show it. Uh, the second thing is that, um, uh, you know, just because you have a phase transition does not necessarily imply you have broken spin flip symmetry like you have in the ferromagnet or the anti-ferromagnet. Um, you know, you could have something like, like in Kosslitz Thales, for example, in the two-dimensional XY model. Um, there you have a phase transition, but you don't have any broken symmetry, um, you know, uh, broken spin, you know, broken um, uh, spatial symmetry, uh, you know, above and below the transition. You have a single pure state above the transition and a single pure state below the transition, but the two pure states are different. 
So the next thing is to prove, or as we all believe, and as numerical simulations clearly indicate, that there is broken spin Phillips symmetry between below TC. But you know, those of us that you know who like doing things mathematically really do, would like to prove that these things in fact are true. And then, of course, there's determine which of these four pictures, if any, correctly describes, you know, assuming that the above two are correct, then it's almost certain that one of these four pictures will be the correct picture. Uh, although, you know, there are other really out there possibilities that might still exist. It's just that we've seen no evidence for any of them. Uh, whereas all the four pictures I mentioned do have numerical simulations that support them. It's just that different numerical simulations done by different groups tend to support different pictures. But um, presumably one of these is indeed the correct picture. You know, you might have combinate, you know, you might have one picture holding in one dimension, another in another dimension, that's possible, or even at different temperatures in the same dimension, all of those things are possible. I, I doubt it, but they're possible. But anyway, figure out what's going on at finite dimension and finite temperature in terms of the low temperature phase. We've narrowed it down considerably. We know a lot more now than we did 20 or 30 years ago, but uh, we're not quite there yet, even though we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Okay, and uh, I'll skip all this. I never talked about an AT line, so I'll stop here and I'll thank all of you very much for your attention during this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a lot of information, and you skipped a lot also, which I, I would have loved to learn more about. Uh, so, a two hour talk, and I'll do it. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> uh, uh, so I, uh, okay. I mean, I can go back and go over some of the stuff if you know you want to stick around and have time. But anyway, let's just open it for questions. Exactly. So, so I, 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 mean, I don't have any questions in the room, but if anyone has questions, on Zoom, please raise your hand. And Zohar, if you want to run this, I can let you know if there's anything in the room. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, are there any questions that anyone wants to ask? Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I, I, I have a question. Uh, yes. In the perspective of numerical study, uh, if we are interested in the excitation, like you said, that, that might be a crucial uh, that could be an answer to answer uh, uh, which of the four pictures is correct uh, in some sense makes sense. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, know numerical, numerically uh, how you define such excitation. For example, if you look at the Domingo wall study uh, in the droplet theory, they are changing the boundary condition from yep. parallel to antiferrobic. So this, yep. this will be a yep. uh, large extension always the uh, scale with the system size that attach to the boundary. So yes. also people uh, like Kasukala, they uh, look at the uh, the low excitations, uh, like flipping a bond in, in the 3D systems. Mm -hmm. So these are different kinds of extensions and see different um, uh, behavior of the size and right. energy. Right. So do you think that uh, there could be a case that there were, could be uh, different kinds of extensions that... Uh, uh, they 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 follow different pictures. Well, that was that was sort of the point, I guess, of the last couple of slides. The point is that each of these mm. four pictures uh, predicts, or is you know either starts from or predicts different kinds of excitations. Droplet scaling uh, mm. predicts that the thermodynamically relevant excitations, which are large length scale excitations, are always you know you don't care about a single flip. You're talking about things that affect the thermodynamic structure. Um, mm. You know that those are compact droplets whose energy increases with the size of the system. TNT mm. says that the excitations are, you know, unbounded and that the energy of those excitations remains order one, regardless of how far you look, how, lo how mm. large a scale you look. Um, and, you know, replica symmetry breaking has space filling or positive density interfaces whose energy remains of order one. And chaotic pairs predicts uh, uh, space filling into uh, positive density interfaces um, with energy increasing with the size mm. of the system. So each of these corresponds to different kinds of excitations. And yes, numerical experiments have indeed looked at excitations. Uh, you know, basically the interfaces when you go from periodic to antiperiodic. That's how you do these things. Um, mm. And the problem is, of course, is that, you know, the trouble is that numerical simulations, no matter how large a size you go to, it's really not large enough 
to really, I mean, you know, people have done that and they've said what they think things look like when you extrapolate, but it's really very, very hard um, to determine whether, uh, you know, for example, when, uh, uh, you know, uh, Palacini and Young and Jacqueline Martin did their paper and they said that the excitations are of lower dimensionality uh, yeah. than the uh, space dimensionality, right? Then there was, uh, there was a comment by, you know, the Rome group that said, no, actually, they're the same dimension. And it's very hard to tell the difference. That's one of the problems with numerical simulations. A lot of numerical, since you asked about them, a lot of numerical simulations tend to look at overlaps, at spin overlaps. Turns mm -hmm. out that there's a lot of problems with that, which, you know, if I was giving a several lecture series, I'd get into all of that stuff. But there's a lot of problems with that. And um, and, and in particular, uh, uh, you know, one has to go to extremely large systems, well beyond uh, what anybody has ever done to really decisively determine what's going on. That's one of the reasons why progress has just been so slow. Um, you yeah. know, it's, it's basically because uh, simulations at this point, uh, you know, there used to be two problems. One had to do with whether you we were equilibrating. That problem has largely been solved by new techniques. Well, not new anymore, but, you know, techniques such as parallel tempering and others. And, and then there's the question of, um, you know, so that's been solved, but now the question about how big a size do you need to go? And there's some work on that. And the answer looks like you have to go to very large sizes. Like for example, suppose you believe in droplet scaling. Um, yeah. you know, so, so for example, one thing that the, the Rome group does is they look at the overlap distribution and they look at how, remember that if I just go back uh, to this picture here, right, you notice that they're at zero overlap, you have a positive weight, right? And so they look at this. Hi. Okay, so they, they, they look at this and, uh, you know, they ask, as you go to larger and larger systems, does this remain steady or does it fall down, which would be predicted by droplet scaling, which would say you just have a pair of delta functions here and here. Well, you know, um, basically you know, they say that it doesn't move and therefore that supports replica symmetry breaking. But uh, people who've looked at <clears throat> corrections to scaling, uh, you know, droplet scaling pictures show that, well, the size that you have to go to before you start to see that is well beyond uh, anything that's ever, that's been looked at yet. So, you know, that still remains an open problem. Is that the question you asked? I want to make sure. Well, you exactly. Uh, thank you for answering that question. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Vance. Are, are there other questions? Actually, Dan, maybe it's something I should not, I should know, but I just know. So what's special about six dimensions? What, what do people think of six dimensions are? Oh, that's a very good question. Well, this has been uh, particularly emphasized by Mike Moore. So there's a bunch of there's a whole bunch of um, really theoretical, obviously, because <laughs> um, you get too high for numerics or experiments. Um, but there's a lot of theoretical reasons to believe that six might be a crossover dimension. In fact, back in the 90s, uh, I think Condor, Di Dominicis, and Temeshvari, they did one loop corrections in field theory, and they showed that um, that uh, above six dimensions, replica symmetry break was stable to one loop corrections, but that it became unstable as one approached six dimensions. Mike Moore had other studies that looked at the dimensionality of interfaces, but doing, doing these um, sort of renormalization group studies um, and, and using some numerics to back them up, uh, but basically it's mo mostly analytical that showed that um, the uh, interfaces according to these kind of field theoretical calculations, which, you know, you know, some people believe and others don't, um, uh, that, that the, the dimensionality seemed to be strictly less than the space dimensionality. But as you approach D, it gets closer and closer. And that at six, it seems to match the spatial dimensionality. So that's another reason. There's others as well, but that's just two examples of the kinds of things that people have done to, you know, that, that indicates that six might be uh, the crossover dimension above which replica symmetry breaking holes and below which it doesn't. I see.
So can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back to your last slide about broken C2 symmetry. Broken, oh yeah, okay, uh, hold on. Let me find it. Uh, uh, but essentially, uh, they, they, okay, it's, you know, there we go. Proof there is broken spin flip that is C2 symmetry below TC. Correct, yeah. So the question is why, I mean, I, I know lambda theory of phase transitions, I know this, but why in this particular case, you, uh, you are sure that there should be a broken, you know, C2 symmetry, mm -hmm. probably connected to some other parameter that probably is related to the other parameter you were talking about. Uh -huh. Uh, oh, sorry, go on. Yes, because, you know, something that, you know, there aren't these four pictures and something that comes to my mind is that, you know, it could be the case that, you know, some of the things are not really, you know, from the point of view of usual theory of phase transition, okay, is not exactly a bad property. You know, what if, you know, what if boundary conditions, okay, uh, are, you know, very, you know, very, have a very strong effect, okay? Right, Such that that, some that of the wouldn't issues. be the case in many state pictures, exactly. It would not be the case in the two state pictures. In many state pictures, that's exactly another way of phrasing the question. Do boundaries arbitrarily far away? If you change the boundary condition, can you change a correlation function near the origin? Exactly. So, yeah. so, so, I mean, it's a very hard problem. So what can you say about that? I mean, it's a, it's extremely hard problem. You mean, why, you mean why, why, do, why do I think there's broken spin flip symmetry? Why does why do we all think there's broken spin flip symmetry? Yes. Why why I mean, is this something accepted or there are or there are, you know, uh counter arguments to the usual Landau theory of phase transitions? Yeah, well, the Landau theory of phase transitions, I mean, you know, basically. Uh, you know, the field theoretical approach does uh, proceed by, you know, writing an effective uh, free energy, you know, in an expansion of a rather complex order parameter and then looking, uh, you know, finding the saddle point and, you know, all the rest of that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, why... I, I mean, so why, why, why do you say that this is against the norm of the, I mean- No, 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 it's not against. I mean, this is the yeah. usual picture right. of Landau that's theory right. of that's right. that's, Okay, okay, that, that I agree. I, I just, I somehow thought I heard you say the opposite. I, no, I, no, 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 that is oh, a natural okay. thing. Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah, that is the natural thing. Um. Well, okay, why do people believe it? Well, two reasons, first, as you say, it is a natural thing, but there's more evidence, namely that every numerical simulation, one thing that everybody agrees on is that uh, when you, um, let me go back to, uh, so, uh, okay, look at this thing here. It's, uh, it's, so, okay, when you, um, when, when people look at the spin overlap, uh, one thing they all agree on is that replace this M squared by, plus Q Edwards Anderson and minus Q Edwards Anderson. Everyone always sees a pair of peaks at plus or minus Q Edwards Anderson. Well, the Edwards Anderson order parameter, if I go back to, um, and I should have said this, actually, I should have said this, um, but let me go over here. Okay, so, so if you look at this, notice that um, another way of thinking of the Edwards Anderson order parameter is that it is a measure of the broken spin flip symmetry in the system. Because if you do not have broken spin flip symmetry, then by definition, the thermal expectation of each of the spins is zero, right? Um, you know, so, uh, you know, because I mean, it has to be zero, it can't be some number not zero given the symmetry uh, of the system. So, um, you know, everything, everything has equal weight about zero. Uh, so the fact that you always see this pair of peaks at plus or minus Q Edwards Anderson means that uh, basically it means that states must come and spin reversed pairs, right? Um, there's no other explanation for that. Right, but I mean, uh, 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 on the other hand, you have, you know, this replica symmetry breaking argument. 
No, no. replica symmetry breaking does assume that there's broken spin flip symmetry, right? If you look over here, right? Notice that there's always a pair of, no, first of all, notice that it's symmetric about Q equals zero. That already is what you would expect for broken spin flip symmetry. If you I put see. a magnetic field on where you break the spin flip symmetry, what you'll have is you'll have, you know, basically there'll be a minimum Q and then you'll only see delta functions on one side, okay? So that is a measure. So, so that's when you do not have spin flip symmetry. But you always have this pair of delta functions at plus or minus Q over Sanderson. So, um, you know, so yeah, I said that uh, replica symmetry breaking says that there's an infinite um, set of pure state pairs, which is another way of saying that there is broken spin flip symmetry because pure states come in pairs in, um, in, uh, in, in replica symmetry breaking, which means that you have broken spin flip symmetry. Hmm. You, you don't seem convinced. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I follow you. I follow yeah. you. Okay. Um, I mean, as I, as I said, you know, it's possible that, you know, the reason why I said, okay, the reason why I said um, maybe, maybe I should re put things a little differently. The reason why I said prove there is broken spin flip symmetry below TC, because if we have not proven it, then ex your, your question is an extremely good one, right? And it is a good one right now. How do we know there's broken spin flip symmetry? All we have is numerical evidence. We don't have anything else. And um, it would be nice to show that in fact, there is broken spin flip symmetry below TC. One, as you said, but one would expect that, right? In these easing models, um, you know, where, uh, you know, you, you have, where you do have a global spin flip symmetry in the Hamiltonian, uh, you know, uh, in the low temperature phase, then, you know, you ordinarily do have broken spin flip symmetry. One does expect the same in the spin glass. The, 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 where Sherrington and Kirkpatrick went wrong and where Edwards and Anderson, when they proposed that order parameter, but as we know now, they couldn't know that then, um, is that they assumed, uh, they assumed that there is broken spin flip symmetry, but you know it, that that there was nothing more than that. That you just had a pair of states that are global flips of each other, right? And each of those is a separate pure state, which is another way of saying you have broken spin flip symmetry. They didn't realize that there's all these other states as well, but each of those come in pairs as well, because there's broken spin flip symmetry. So replica symmetry breaking. All of these pictures, uh, they all assume that there is broken spin flip symmetry. If there's not, then they're all wrong. Uh, you know, and of course, it could be there's no phase transition at all, in which case it's a power magnet all the way down. And the only interesting thing is dynamics. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Um, okay. All right. I think there is uh, another question. Okay. Please, please ask. No, no. I think that there is a hand. Okay, yeah, yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Go, go ahead. Uh, no, I was, um, so, no, I was just going to say that probably we should start closing the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. community bar, but if people want to stay on, on Zoom, you're you are welcome to, to do that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, absolutely. I, 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 actually, Martin Wigg also, uh, he thanks you for talking. Yes, I, I saw it. That's nice. Thank you. Actually, I mean, a very silly question on my part. I mean, yeah. a few people in the, in the department, including myself, that, that work on this. Yeah. Uh, in particular, sort of Ken Kelsen and, and Anoop. I mean, um, a, so so how does this? Uh, I mean, relate to a structural glasses. I mean, so people, oh. well, lots of ideas. People, and of course, I know this is not what you really necessarily. No, 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 no. So that, that's fine. Yeah, but, but, um, yeah. Uh, well, in fact, you know, we don't know. Um, there are a number of so there are theories um, like the random first order transition theory of glasses that uh, does use. Um, you know, that, that is what's called one step replica symmetry breaking. I don't want to get into the, the you know, the, the nitty gritty details, but it is a form of replica symmetry breaking for, and they use, uh, you know, pot spin glasses as a model for structural glasses. And, you know, they have a lot of interesting results and it is one of the major current theories of structural glasses, but there are others as well uh, that do not use anything from spin glasses. So, you know, whether spin glasses, I mean, obviously the big difference between spin glasses and structural glasses, 
is that structural glasses have an ordered Hamiltonian, right? It's just the ordinary crystalline Hamiltonian. There's no disorder in the Hamiltonian. Glasses are formed by quenching, you know, rapidly enough so that you go out of equilibrium. Whereas spin glasses, you know, we, we believe do have a true uh, low temperature equilibrium disordered phase. So that's already one big difference between uh, structural glasses and spin glasses. Now, people have said maybe there's an underlying transition and all of that, but that's all open. So, so the, the, the main point of contact, I would say, is in one of the theories, one of the many theories currently circulating of regular glasses or structural glasses, the, the random first order transition theory that, um, you know, basically models structural glasses as a POTS spin glass um, with one step replica symmetry breaking. Now, a number of people, myself included, Jim Langer and others, have criticized this as, you know, basically saying, well, you know, why, how can you model a glass this way? I mean, just be, you know, because you get results that look sort of like a glass, you know, how do we, un it, does it help with understanding? Uh, that I can't answer. That's a matter of personal opinion. Um, but, but yes, I mean, people have used spin glass ideas for sure in replica symmetry breaking to propose theories of structural glasses, but whether those theories are right, we don't know. And actually just for what if it's a replica symmetry breaking, the P of Q, would it look continuous or would it be discrete? In, in, uh, for what? For, for one step replica symmetry breaking. Uh, no, for one step replica symmetry breaking, it would be discrete. So can, can can I continue my question and, and go back to <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Please. Sorry. I mean, is it feasible that perhaps, I, I don't know, but is it feasible that perhaps, uh, you know, if this concept is strongly dependent on boundary conditions, that, you know, some boundary conditions prefer one picture and another boundary condition prefers oh. another one. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, okay but then... <laughs> yeah, what, what, uh, but what's the question? Uh, yeah, okay, no, 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 I'm just reinforcing, but then, yeah, no, I, no, mean... No, I mean... Uh, okay, so, I'm sorry, let me let me just sort of explain here. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, boundary condition, in fact, you know, uh, what I did not mention, because, you know, I wanted to keep the... I, 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 I wanted to, you know, not make it more complicated than necessary. No, 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 it was, it was a beautiful talk. Oh, no, I mean, oh, this is my okay. ignorance. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but I, I should I should say that um, you know we we have a picture uh, basically where we introduce a new mathematical construct called a metastate, and the metastate basically is constructed by taking sequences of volumes with boundary conditions, and then you know sort of um, uh, looking at um, well, let's just say. Uh, you know, looking at various distributions among different states, it gets rather complicated. But the point is, these are heavily dependent on the boundary conditions, right? Basically, if you have, you know, all periodic boundary conditions, you get one minute state. If you use all anti-periodic boundary conditions, in principle, you think you get a different meta state, but in fact, you get the same one that we can prove. Um, and that doesn't, but, 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 so, so, but this meta state is a higher, uh, it's a meta construct, so to speak. To get to your point, the point that the real point is this, and 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 this is you know, uh, uh, I wonder if I uh, let me see if I have a slide where I discuss this where I that I didn't use. Um, oh, here's a picture of of what the uh, let me just uh, sorry, uh, I saw to say, oh yeah. This is what the overlap structure would look like if you put on a magnetic field where you break the spin flip symmetry. I see. Just mentioning that. Um, mm, 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 let's see here. Uh, okay, well, I don't have what I wanted, but uh, the, the, point is, the point is this. Uh, basically, if you the question of whether there are many states is exactly equivalent, uh, well, let's just say more than one Gibbs state. If you have more than one Gibbs state, so, you know, suppose you're at the high temperature phase with a power magnet. Then I get the same state in the, in the interior, regardless of what boundary conditions I choose. Boundary conditions don't affect, don't change, I should say, what you see in the deep interior. Mm -hmm. The signature of multiple 
Gibbs states of any kind of, you know, no matter how they're distributed. And all of these pictures, all four of these pictures here have um, multiple Gibbs states, uh, right? There's, there's two Gibbs states, right? Two pure states. These pure states are themselves Gibbs states. They're just extremal. Uh, droplet scaling in TNT, and then you have many in replica symmetry breaking in chaotic pairs. So um, basically, so this says what these pictures say is that um, so if I go to if I take periodic or anti-periodic or free boundary conditions, then uh, these two say that if I change from periodic to anti-periodic, I won't change what goes on inside. But if I take a fixed boundary condition like all plus. Uh, for example, and I change it to all minus, then I will change the Gibbs state inside because those explicitly break the spin flip symmetry and I pick out one state or the other, just like with a ferromagnet, right? Ferromagnet, if I go to very large volumes, I put in plus boundary conditions, mm -hmm. all the correlation functions in the deep interior will correspond to those of the po positively magnetized state. If I change to minus boundary conditions, I'll change all the, all the odd correlation functions everywhere inside. Right, that's a signature of multiple Gibbs states. Uh, replica symmetry breaking and in, in, in chaotic pairs, what they basically say is that I've, if I switch from periodic to anti-periodic boundary conditions in a very large volume, then I will change um, the uh, correlation functions deep in the interior. So, I mean, so, so, so this, this, this is exactly as you say, it is very much related to this question about how I sensitive think. it is to boundary. That's exactly the same. Saying what, or is there one or many Gibbs states is exactly the same question. I, I say, if I change the boundary conditions far away, can I change a correlation function near the origin? Okay, I missed that piece, but this was my question. Yeah, okay, well, that no, means... I didn't, you know, the thing is that I, um, I, I, I didn't <laughs> say that. I did not say that in the talk, um, yeah. but, but, Okay, you gave me a chance to say it, so thanks. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is this is a big question. And okay. now, I mean, the evidence. I mean, I mean, Ken, you want to ask a question? Sorry, I don't want to. Hello. No, I'm fine. I'm just listening. <laughs> ah, so 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 I mean, going back to the example that the Nobel Committee yep. <laughs> put out there. Hmm. Uh, you mean so, the random laser? Are you talking about the random yeah, laser? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay um, here it How is. How truthful is this? <laughs> how, uh, let, let's put, I mean, how much, you know, PR and how much physics is here? I uh, mean, I, yeah, well, I mean uh, you know, okay, I, 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 I got to be honest. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not thoroughly convinced, to be honest, that um, this really is... <laughs> one step replica symmetry raking, um, you know, especially because these are also, you know, rather limited finite systems as well. Exactly. Right? So. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just, I, 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 my only point is that this has been, you know, as I wrote, cited by the Nobel Committee, therefore disclaiming any responsibility myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the Nobel Committee apparently was convinced, uh, but um, I I, 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 to be honest, I'm not I, like you. I mean, I think it may be for sure. You know, I mean, it, it certainly looks like it could be, but I, I don't consider it conclusive evidence by any means, you know, okay. but that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean, I conclude that because you you finish your talk, you know, <laughs> I mean, in a different way. So, yeah. but okay, no, thank you very much. Very, very nice talk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Enjoyed yeah. it very much. Well, thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dan. I'm sorry that you couldn't come I mean, but really thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't come too. I really would have liked to visit, but hopefully another time. Let me get a few more results and maybe in a few years we'll do it again. <laughs> okay. <That> sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> I have to warn you, progress is slow. We may all be in our 90s, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm closer than you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. I do appreciate it. And uh you know, I hope to uh, see all of you again soon. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you very much. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.